on full bed methane. And um, uh, Lydia's been with the Bureau of Mines since, uh, in Billings since 2007, uh, having received her PhD at the University of Wyoming uh, just prior to that. And then when I asked her where she grew up and came from, she, she was a little <laughs> unwilling to commit, you know. <laughs> but a little cagey. She, <laughs> <laughs> she grew up in a lot of places. Um, but most interestingly is that she's actually a, she's a, she's a fusion, at least uh, genetically. And her, her uh, great uncle was Harry Brink, who had a building that is now no longer. And uh, her great great grandfather died in the Speculator Mine Fire. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, she, she should have the tattoo of the whole people. So, <laughs> we'll, we'll arrange that. Yeah. And a mug at the quarry. <laughs> right, right. If Harry owed you money, don't come looking to me. So, Liddy, take it away. All right. Well, thanks for inviting me. Um, this work was done under the GWIT program, and so a lot of you may have heard uh, some of this, some of these results. I'm going to hopefully go into a little more detail, uh, aside from some of the fast kind of summaries you've heard so far. So it was um, uh, most recently under the GWIT program, but the methodology was developed under an MSU Water Center seed grant. So they got me started down this road. And, and if I really want to be honest, this title should really be the potential effects of coal bed methane on stream depletion because that was really what we were looking at. Um, the effects of coal bed methane on stream flow has been investigated um, by many researchers looking for impacts to quantity and quality. And for the most part, um, real effects are minimal to below detection at this point in most, in most cases. But what I'm going to be talking about is a way to measure what the potential effect could be given continued coal bed methane development. So the reason coal bed methane is the driving force behind this is because in order to produce methane out of coal seams, you need to withdraw large amounts of water. And these coal seams are used extensively throughout the Powder River Basin for many uses, including groundwater wells that are used for domestic and stock. But also the coal itself is a resource. Um, and so if you withdraw this water for coal bed methane, these coals eventually on a subcrop to streams and so therefore may be providing an important source of base flow to those streams. So you may be intercepting the water before it gets to the stream. Also uh, what came up quite a bit during the heyday of coal bed methane was the fact that Montana requires a water right in order to produce, to put produced water to beneficial use, which could be irrigation, it could be stock water. However, it's difficult for industry to get a water right um, because they need to be able to show that they're not going to be impacting down gradient users. And if they expect an impact, then they need to make appropriate compensation. And so being able to quantify those impacts was important. So we were out there, we were trying to quantify that amount of base flow to the rivers for those reasons, to both to look at water right issues, but also to look at potential in-stream flow effects. And um, the information that we were hoping to get, <coughs> to get out of this would be necessary for DNRC to evaluate the water right applications. So uh, first, a little bit about coal as a resource. As I mentioned, it's used for domestic and stock wells. It's extensively used throughout the basin because coals provide a, pl a fairly plentiful, um, fairly high flow in the, for this area, four to 10 gallons per minute, which is plenty for cows, um, and reasonable quality. Um, generally considered too salty for humans to drink, but cows generally drink it with no problem. Um, so it's a good source of water, and coals are extensive throughout this basin, so it's a pretty good shot that you'll get a coal well if you're looking for one. This is a coal spring. It's a developed spring coming out of a coal seam, which um, maybe you can see a little bit of right there. So and coal is a, another source of plentiful springs in this area, and so the springs are often developed for cattle use as well. Um, 
And another use of coal that Montana is very familiar with is the mining aspect of it. So coal itself is a resource. The water in the coal is a resource. Um, another picture of some mining. But also the methane in the coal is a resource. So there's three resources all wrapped up in one, in one geologic unit, which is pretty unique. So a little bit about coal bed methane. It's not the news item it used to be, so I'll go into it a little bit for those of you who aren't familiar. Coal bed methane is naturally occurring methane in coal seams. It's held in place by hydrostatic pressure. So in order to release that methane from the coal, you need to reduce the hydrostatic pressure through pumping of the water out of the coal. In order to do that, water wells are installed in the coal. Water is extracted through an internal pipe to the surface. The methane then under that lower pressure is released from the coal, collects into an annular pipe, is brought up to the surface and put to a, a compressor station and then into, the, into, the, into use as a, an energy source. The water at the surface needs to be managed for disposal. In Montana, it's treated as a waste product. And so they needed to treat it before either putting it into a, a pond or putting it into um, the rivers. So coal bed methane is both a quantity issue in that there's a large amount of water being withdrawn from the coal, but it's also a quantity issue when it's discharged at the surface, or a quality issue when it's discharged at the surface, because it does have moderately high saline uh, composition, and that salinity has a large portion of sodium. And so that sodium is an irrigation issue. Uh, sodium interacts with the Powder River Basin clays, in a negative fashion, it causes them to, to slake and flocculate. So um, it has to be treated very carefully when you're applying it to the surface. Coal bed methane in Montana, here's a little summary of where we stand today. The circles indicate the number of producing wells at any given month in Montana starting in two, uh, 1999 until the end of last year. And you can see um, the number of wells peaked here in 2008. The solid line here is the amount of water that was produced from these wells. And then the dotted line here is the amount of gas that was produced from these wells. So all of these um, factors peaked in 2008. The price of gas or the price of methane dropped precipitously <coughs> and the number of wells uh, mirrored that drop. So it's a fairly marginal gas to produce in the first place because there's an additional cost associated with managing the water. And so um, it very quickly became not economical for the industry to be producing it once um, the price of gas dropped to, to what it is today. And you can see that the water dropped off um, just as fast as the wells, as did the gas. However, um, it's not simply the water management cost issue. The story is the same in Wyoming, where the peak happened um, approximately in 2008 as well, and it's dropped off similarly. Whereas the uh, number of wells in Montana was um, peaked at about 700, now we're closer to 50 or 60 operating wells. In Wyoming, it peaked at over 18,000 in just the Powder River Basin side of um, in Wyoming. And now it's down to uh, just around 8,000 producing wells. And Wyoming's regulatory structure is much different than Montana's. Wyoming requires that the water be put to, to beneficial use rather than treated as a waste product. And so it's not strictly a regulatory question we're talking about. It's an economic one. Water from an individual well, um, we know quite a bit about it now because in Montana we've had production for over 12 years. Uh, when it first began in Montana in the late 90s, the EIS was put together but between state and federal agencies. They predicted water from an individual CBM well would be produced along this line. That's this solid exponential curve here. Um, starting at around 15, 14, 15 gallons per minute, falling off to very little, a couple gallons a minute at the end of the well's life. In reality, wells in Montana produced along this line on average, so generally starting off quite a bit lower than was anticipated, 
at around six, seven gallons per minute, but it did not fall off as fast um, and did not drop as low as was predicted. If you look at total amount of water that was produced in the basin as of 2011 when I last did this analysis, um, 270 billion barrels of water was produced, but that's approximately half of what was anticipated to be produced. So the geologic structure in Montana played a big part in that. There's a lot of no-flow boundary faulting going on and which limits the aerial extent of drawdown of an individual well. So the amount of water that was produced and therefore had to be managed was quite a bit less. But still not an insignificant amount of water withdrawn from these coals. The coals that we're talking about in Montana, we're talking about the Fort Union formation in Montana that um, exclusively uh, was the producing zone. In Wyoming, they had a couple of other zones, but Montana, the, produce, the production was all from the Fort Union formation. And that's, um, as you can see, a number of coals of varying thicknesses. Um, the Fort Union is a, a package of sandstone shales and coals. Um, and these red squares represent where the production zones are in Montana, in Montana and Wyoming. So you can see that most of these coals are produced at some point in the basin. The basin itself we're talking about is the Powder River Basin. Um, here's the North South Dakota, Montana, Wyoming intersection. Um, Miles City, Ashland, and Gillette for reference, Casper down here. Mm -hmm. So it extends essentially from Casper to Miles City. All of our work was done in Montana. Um, we did do a little bit of work in, in Wyoming, but don't tell the Bureau of Mines that we did that crossing the border. Um, the recharge in the basin is along the edges where outcrop, generally it's outcrop areas. Coal, um, when it burns, creates clinker outcrops and clinker is an extremely conductive geologic material and so clinker tends to be one of the major sources of recharge to coal beds in the Powder River Basin recharges along the edge, moves towards the center, and then north. And so, in general, everything's moving kind of in and up towards a discharge point at um, the Yellowstone River. I'm going to next show you a cross-section, north-south cross-section along here, where the state line, um, everything, again, moving kind of northward towards the Yellowstone River. The coal beds are trending somewhat upward. So here's a point um, where water is running uphill and it's discharging into the rivers. Either in this case, this example is a powder river. It could be the Yellowstone River. It could be the Tongue River. Um, and the water wells tend to access either coals or sandstones within this Fort Union formation. This is the Lebo Shale member of that, of the uh, formation, which is a extremely uh, low flow, uh, it's an aquitard, a very, uh, a very effective barrier to flow. So water within this unit does not really have anywhere else to go except to discharge at the surface because it can't move downward through the Lebo Shale. So it's a barrier that forces that water to daylight either at springs or at streams or at wells. And in this case, I have an example of a CBM well that's accessing the Knobloch coal up gradient from where it's discharging to, um, to the surface. And so you can see in this situation, theoretically you might see an impact to surface flow if the water is, is withdrawn at um, an up gradient location. The reason we're out there is not simply an academic one. Um, it's not simply just to see whether we can do this. It's to answer some questions that are pertinent to Montana. Montana uh, brought a lawsuit against Wyoming in 2007. It was in the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court, um, since that time. In 2013, they found initially um, that yes, Wy Montana's claim was that Wyoming was violating a 1950s compact about um, use along the Yellowstone River tributaries. 
and they decided that yes, um, it was true that Wyoming was irrigating more acres than they had agreed to. They had withdrawn more groundwater than they had agreed to, and they had created more dams than they had agreed to. But um, Wyoming farmers had improved the irrigation practices from switching to from flood to pivot, and so therefore they were allowed to keep that water savings and irrigate the additional acreage. The what claimed that Montana made that the irrigation return flow that you would normally see through flood irrigation was in reality Montana's was not upheld. However, what they left undecided was the question of whether CBM activity was impacting, was, was an additional violation of this 1950s compact. So that went to a special master who is a law professor at Stanford and he just um, just issued his decision or his recommendation to the Supreme Court at the end of last year. So in, uh, near the very end of December 2014, he, um, he said that Montana had failed to show that CBM was affecting stream flow. But the bigger question was that Montana had failed to show injury in the first place. So they never even really addressed whether CBM could affect stream flow because Montana, in all the years that they claimed Wyoming had violated this compact, had never actually shown that an injury had occurred. Except for two years, 2004 and 2006, which were drought years, they claimed that the ranchers, the irrigators in Montana were being shorted their senior water rights. So those were the only, the only amount of water that the Supreme Court was willing to consider was an injury to Montana, which was of the 10,000 acre feet Montana requested or would like considered, they agreed to 1,356. And at the time in 2004 and 2006, there was excess water in the Tongue River Reservoir that was being sold for $10 an acre foot. So Wyoming has put forth that they owe Montana $14,000. Um, specific to the role of coal bed methane in this compact, the special master said that there was insufficient evidence that groundwater pumping associated with coal bed methane caused a reduction in flow to the Tongue River. But then they said, uh, he goes on to say, um, because there was no discernible impact at the surface from these wells, groundwater turned out to be an insignificant issue in this case. So not only did Montana not show that CBM was an issue, they had failed to show that there was an issue to begin with. So to talk a little bit about the methodology, so I talked about where we are, why we were doing what we were doing. This is how we were looking at the question of base flow, the question of groundwater, coal aqua discharge to streams. You can think of in-stream flow as a combination of what's already there plus any additional sources, which could be bedrock aquifer discharge to the stream, could be alluvial aquifer discharge, or it could be surface runoff, which alluvial aquifer and surface runoff I have um, encompassed here in B. We went out in winter in order to hopefully minimize um, to zero this, comp this contribution from B. So no irrigation return flow, all surface uh, contribution, hopefully frozen. So limiting the C to what was already in the river to and plus whatever was coming in from this bedrock unit. And the bedrock that we were specifically interested in was coal. To do that, we looked at carbon and strontium isotopes, and we did that because it's been shown in the literature to be effective. Those two isotopes effectively fingerprint coal aquifer groundwater in this area, as opposed to surface water. So surface water and coal aquifers generally have measurably, measurably different isotope signatures. Uh, carbon is measured is the 13 to 12 isotope ratio as measured against and it's it's quoted in a delta 13 C notation as the so it's the 13 to 12 ratio as it differs from a standard um, in this case the PD bellum night so these numbers tend to be you know in the 0 to 40 range or negative 40 range um, so the reason they give this delta notation is to make it easier to talk about. Strontium is still 
notated in the strict ratio of 87 to 86 strontium and so the numbers are generally pretty small and the changes are in the fourth fifth decimal place to a real brief uh, summary of why we're going to this geochemistry uh, tactic rather than looking at more traditional hydrogeologic get out there measure flow rates in the stream see if it gets bigger this is an example from Tom Halick's study um, that uh, that he and the Gwippers are working on which showed pumping out of um, out of an alluvial source that discharges to the river and how it impacts in-stream flow so the Gallatin River with no pumping is the blue which you can kind of see at the top of these peaks here um, with pumping is the red so if you can imagine trying to discern that while you're standing in a river measuring 12 points across um, it would be like looking for a needle in a haystack a lot of times so we were looking for something that had the fine-tuned ability to look at very small amounts of water in um, in significant water although um, the powder river basin is not known for its its big streams this is a theoretical cross-section of a stream in the powder river basin and what we were working at and how we how we chose our sample sites so in every location what we looked for was a well that was completed solely in the coal that we were interested in and because of some work we did in 2010, we did a coal isotope survey of the Knobloch coal throughout the basin. Um, we found that there was quite a bit of variability geospatially in the, coal, the carbon isotope ratio of that same coal. So we knew we had to get as close to outcrop as possible in order to get an accurate representation of the end member of that coal discharge to the stream. So in order to get the end member that would be mixing with the stream, we looked for wells close to outcrop and completed only in a single coal. That was one, one of our samples. That was one end member. The other end member was sampling the stream up gradient from that coal aquifer discharge point. So we called that our surface water end member. So that plus the coal aquifer end member gave us our two mixing points. And then we sampled the river as it crossed the outcrop um, through the outcrop and down below the outcrop and from there we looked for changes that could be attributed to groundwater base flow this is an example well i should say um, i gave this talk to the billings people yesterday and they said it was really boring very white get some pictures in there so if you get nothing else, maybe you'll, <laughs> maybe you'll see some, um, some of the Eastern Montana natural beauty. So here's a picture of um, coal outcrop along Hanging Woman Creek. It's very difficult to see coal outcrop in the wild. It's, um, this is a good example, you know, it, because there's no vegetation, because the slope is pretty steep, you can actually see a little bit of coal in there. For the most part, you never see any coal. Never see it in outcrop. However, um, along the Tongue River, and I have a picture of that that I'll be showing you later, there was a beautiful example of a coal outcrop subcropping to the Tongue River. And so, mostly it looks like this, or worse, um, I have one example of when um, we knew exactly where that coal was outcropping. Um, so this is the Hanging Woman Creek uh, Valley. What we were looking to do, I mentioned that we tried to sample in winter in order to minimize agricultural return flow and surface flow, surface runoff. Uh, we were also looking to get at the base flow of a river so these are the average hydrographs for the tongue the powder hangman creek and otter creek um, these scales are different uh, for obvious reasons so the tongue river peaks 1200 cfs um, in you know at max flow same with uh, the powder river somewhere around 14 13 14 cf 100 cfs hanging woman creek um, on a good day is 8 CFS. Generally when we were out there it was 1 CFS or less. Otter Creek to um, maybe gets up to 12 CFS. During the floods of 2011 it got up to 300 CFS. 
and my goodness, it was out of control. Like, topped all the bridges, topped all the culverts. So, um, but these are significant streams in the Powder River Basin. You know, they might be drains in, in western Montana, like irrigation return drains, but, but these are significant creeks that mean a lot to the people who use them. So we were trying to get out there at base flow in order to maximize the percent composition of, of the groundwater uh, contribution. We knew it wasn't going to be much, and so we needed the surface water input to be as small as possible so that percentage-wise, the contribution from bedrock would be all the greater, and we would have a much better chance of seeing it. So that generally happens, obviously, in the winter, but we wanted to be able to sample safely so before it froze over. Also, we were looking to get after um, this bump in the hydrograph happens when the transpiration is cut off after the first killing frost. So as soon as the plants are no longer transpiring groundwater directly from the water table, you see a bump in the hydrograph. And that is groundwater that we wanted to count in our geochemistry. And so we tried to get out there after the plants were no longer intercepting the groundwater on its way to the river. So we were giving ourselves the best chance to see, uh, to see this groundwater uh, contribution, also giving us the best chance um, at getting some frostbitten <laughs> toes because we were out there waiting in, in zero degree weather. Um, I kept saying, whose idea was this? This was a terrible idea. Um, where were we? This is Ashland. This is Broadus. This is the state line over here. Um, so the first two streams I'm going to talk about are Otter Creek and the Powder River. Otter Creek meets the Tongue River at Ashland, uh, and the Powder River uh, begins in Wyoming. Otter Creek doesn't actually have live water until close to the town of Otter. Powder River starts in Wyoming, crosses the state line, eventually meets the Yellowstone River near the town of Terry along I-94. This is a picture of Otter Creek. Um, this was when we sampled in 2010. We sampled through the ice, um, so we didn't get flow rates, but we did get grab samples. Um, it's a really pretty area. This is a cross-section constructed using groundwater, groundwater wells and the notation of coal within the groundwater logs. So the, t the stream of Otter um, essentially becomes live near the town of Otter, flows down gradient to the town of Ashland. We sampled it at six locations along there from OC1 to OC6. It crosses this large knoblock coal zone. We sampled the knoblock coal at this well here, which is a part of our monitoring network in southeastern Montana. If you've heard about Otter Creek, it's because they have a proposed coal mine going in there now. It's being uh, permitted and they're going through the EIS process right now. Um, in addition to CBM, coal mines are also a factor on upgrading water withdrawals. They're going to have to dewater the Knobloch coal in order to mine it. The Knobloch coal subcrops to Otter Creek and may be providing uh, important base flow during low flow times. Um, so that was an additional reason we concentrated on Otter Creek. We were out there two years, 2010 and 2013. I'm going to hopefully walk you through this um, somewhat complicated figure. This is down gradient. This, for instance, um, samples collected at Otter, moving down gradient to samples collected at Ashland. The solid lines our samples collected in 2010, and the dash lines are collected in 2013. These are the stream samples. These dash lines up here represent coal aquifer values. We sampled that knoblock coal at the well that I mentioned, WO2, and it had a carbon isotope value of around positive 4, 
and it had a strontium isotope value down here at 7084. And you can see that as the stream moves down gradient from the town of Otter towards the town of Ashland, crossing those knoblock outcrops, the strontium isotope value of the stream is pulled downward toward that value of the coal. Similarly, the carbon isotope ratio of the stream is pulled upward toward the value of the coal aquifer. So this uh, looks like evidence saying that the knoblock coal is providing base flow to the knoblock, to Otter Creek. There's a little hitch here. Taylor Creek doesn't carry surface flow in the winter, but it apparently in 2013 was providing base flow to um, either subsurfacely through alluvial flow to the river. Um, to compare it to normal geochemistry, major ion geochemistry, to show you that this can't be done necessarily with just, um, just normal mixing models. This is uh, a piper diagram of the stream water, which are these circles, and the coal aquifer samples, which are these uh, black squares and an alluvial sample here. So the coal aquifer lands right here in sodium bicarbonate, which is what we expect for a reduced coal system. We had one coal up that wasn't a fully saturated coal, um, looking more like recharge. But you can see that the stream, except for a slight evolution from sulfate towards bicarb, doesn't show that geochemistry of the coal. And if you had any less contribution from the knoblock coal than we had, you would see even less of this pull down towards ge the bicarbonate <coughs> geochemistry. So it'd be very difficult to show conclusively that you're having a contribution of that coal aquifer base flow simply through major ion chemistry. This is a picture of um, the Powder River um, in the summer, and this is later in the summer. And then um, this is what it looks like in cross section. The Powder River, in contrast to Otter Creek, does not have one big fat coal that it's crossing. The Knobloch coal at where Otter Creek crossed it was around the order of 50 feet thick, which is why it's a target for a coal mine. Powder River has a couple of coals, the Brewster Arnold and the Odell, that maybe get up to 15 feet thick. So we're not talking about any one coal that's providing a serious amount of base flow. So the question of how we set up our sampling regime was done somewhat differently. In this case, we tried to bracket this whole Fort Union, as much of the Fort Union as we could that was in Montana. So we sampled near the state line um, four, we sampled four places along the Powder River, starting near the state line at the town of Moorhead until we got to the town of Broadus. We sampled the coal at three wells at our SL8 monitoring site at the Brewster Arnold and the Knobloch, and at the SL9 site at the Brewster Arnold. So we had two Brewster Arnold coal wells and one Knobloch coal well. So a similar story in that as you go down gradient from the state line towards Broadus, the strontium isotope ratio is pulled downward and the carbon isotope ratio is pulled upward. If you put this on a graph with the coal aquifer information, those three wells provided different values, um, but in general, the, the coal carbon isotope ratio fell in this kind of area, the 8 to 16 positive um, carbon isotope ratio, which served to pull this, the surface water carbon isotope ratio upward. The strontium isotope ratio of the coal groundwater, the three coal groundwater samples, fell down in this range, serving to pull that ratio downward as well. Again, some evidence that major ion geochemistry doesn't tell the story or doesn't tell the same story. These samples are the surface water sites. So they didn't show much uh, evolution at all as it flowed down gradient. 
and that's a distance of approximately 40 miles. So there was very little evolution in the major ion geochemistry there. This is the, um, again, the sodium bicarbonate signature of a reduced coal. And in fact, we have a sandstone in the same area that looks a lot like coal. And then the alluvium falls, uh, these are these triangles, is alluvial samples. So the surface water, in, um, for the most part, falls between the alluvium and the coal but doesn't change much as you go down gradient. You can take these values, the, the two end members that I mentioned, the coal aquifer sample, the upstream surface water sample, and you can calculate at your downstream sample how much of the water was additional coal aquifer water. So these values don't represent the total amount of coal aquifer water in the stream. They represent the additional water from where we sampled the up gradient sample until we get to our down gradient samples. So between uh, the town of Otter and the town of Ashland, an additional seven, five to seven percent of the water came from that Knobloch coal. Um, on the Powder River, uh, again, approximately five percent of the water was coming from those coal seams. Uh, the difference in flow rate, um, at base flow, the Powder River can, is 150 to 200 CFS. The Otter Creek is more along the lines of two. So there, we're talking about an order of magnitude, or two orders of magnitude even, difference. Um, the difference between 2010 and 13 is that this is a percent of flow. And so in 2013, the flow rate was significantly lower. And so therefore, the, the, the contribution from groundwater flow was percentage-wise, therefore, higher. Um, we also looked at, at general conservative tracers, tracers that had been shown to be conservative in the literature, including um, temperature, salinity, silica, chloride, and fluoride. However, we only really had any success with fluoride as a conservative tracer in these settings. And if you look at fluoride uh, mixing from uh, from the same in the same areas it did not work on the powder river but it produced percentage wise um, kind of in the same ballpark of what we got for the isotopic signatures um, so this is generally where i end the talk um, i measured five streams and you've seen two for a reason because the other three streams did not work out very well. The data was not nearly so pretty. But um, today, and because we can learn from failure, I'm going to be going into that as well. I also looked at Rosebud Creek, which is a little creek that um, flows across the Northern Cheyenne Reservation, um, <coughs> starts in the Rosebud Battlefield, and ends up meeting the Yellowstone River near the town of Forsyth. The Tongue River crosses the state line. The Tongue River Reservoir is right here. And it meets the Yellowstone River near the town of Miles City along I-94. And Hanging Woman Creek is a tributary. It crosses the state line and meets the Tongue River near the town of Bernie. <coughs> this is um, the best picture I could find of Rosebud Creek. Um, and really, it's just a picture of our monitoring site. The creek is in the background there somewhere. Um, this is uh, when it's on the greener side. So Rosebud Creek also doesn't really have a significant coal package. The, the major coals that uh, the, the creek crosses is the Wall, the Brewster Arnold, and the Knobloch. But again, we're talking about coals that are less than 20 feet thick. So again, and also due to um, surface limitations of where we could sample, we tried to encompass as large of a package as we could, starting up near the battlefield, and then we ended up down um, not quite all the way to coal strip. And so across several coals, there's not a lot of information. There aren't a lot of wells that go past the alluvium in this area to give us that um, subsurface geo geology. Um, the isotope information, this is the coal. We sampled the Brewster Arnold at this well. This is a nested well site, and so we sampled the Brewster Arnold at this well site. And it produced a strontium isotope ratio right here. 
if there was a measurable contribution of coal and if the coals in this area look like the Brewster Arnold, you would expect these surface water samples to eventually trend downward toward uh, looking more and more like that of the coal. And we don't really see that. There's no consistent trend as you move down gradient. Similarly, in the uh, carbon isotope ratio, this is one situation where it is not a good fingerprint because the coal the carbon isotope ratio of the coal is about the same ratio as that of the surface water. So even if there was a contribution, you wouldn't see it in the isotope ratio. There's a difference in the, the concentration of DIC, um, but you're adding a little bit of water with a little bit of DIC, and so we didn't see any contribution. This is the Tongue River Reservoir. It's also very beautiful and a great place if you like boating and fishing. That's the dam. Um, and this is the coal outcrop that I was talking about. This is the only place that we actually could stand on coal outcrop in the Tongue River. And no, Jeanette, don't say anything about our methods here. <laughs> I've heard it before. <laughs> So, um, so Jeanette hates the fact that the tape is way up here, but we, there wasn't much we could do about it. Um, this is the old landowner um, attic or a little sluice box for their own personal coal mine. Um, and so, you know, the, the new thing in, in scientific literature is uh, visual abstracts, uh, I don't know, picture abstracts. And so this is what I would consider our picture abstract, measuring flow rate in a stream at a coal outcrop. This is the best we could do. We never saw anything quite um, so nice as this. Um, but that is the Tongue River, and that's Simon, measuring flow rates. The Tongue River crosses two major coals, the wall coal, Near the, ten, near the dam, just north of the dam, is um, over 50 feet thick. Um, and there were two wells that showed its presence very clearly, very close to outcrop. We sampled it at this site. We also sampled um, across and as far across the coal as we could get with access. Um, this is the Knobloch coal. It was a much more difficult uh, cross section to build. Um, this is where we were standing on the coal, so this, out, this well has that Knobloch coal outcrop fairly well constrained, but um, in retrospect, we may not have chosen our sampling sites wisely. We should have probably, um, should have probably shot to get much further down gradient. Um, but in the end, the Tongue River um, when we were out in 2012 was flowing at um, 100 CFS, which is as low as they want to pull it down. It's all controlled by the dam. They control it in the winter for fisheries. And anything below 100 CFS is stressing the fisheries. So that's about the lowest you can expect. Um, the next year, when we were going to try and go out again and improve on our sampling, uh, it never got below 300 CFS. And so just theoretically knowing um, what we knew about the geochemistry and what we knew about the base flow rates, we knew we would never see it at 300 CFS. So we didn't sample. We know a lot about the base flow in this situation, which makes it a nice place to go and test our methodology because in 1979, the dam broke and they had to shut down all surface flow. And the USGS, and some other hydrologists raced out there and measured bedrock base flow to the river downstream of the dam. So we have some pretty good numbers of what, uh, what winter base flow contribution is to the stream. And we would really have liked to be able to um, corroborate that with our geochemistry methods, but we could not. Um, this is the data. We, uh, we sampled the Knobloch at two locations. Uh, the, the concentration is on the x-axis here. The ratio is on the y-axis. The concentration is fairly different, but the ratio is about the same. This is a wall. That's that wall 
groundwater well that we sampled. <coughs> this is the river. Um, and it may look like it's being pulled downward, but in reality, it didn't get pulled downward with any consistency. It went up and down. And again, on the carbon isotope, the ratio, the concentration, this is the wall coal that we sampled three times. Here's the knoblock coal. Um, again, no trend in the surface water data in the tongue. This is Hanging Woman Creek, which is really better measured in terms of gallons per minute than CFS. This is what the valley looks like. It's an extremely underfit stream. There's a huge alluvial package and a stream that runs usually sub one CFS. Again, that's Simon. Um, you can kind of see some coal outcropping along this, along this exposure. This is also Hanging Woman Creek upgrading of where we're sampling. Um, and it looks like this all the way through into Wyoming. A lot of salt, um, a lot of not much water. Hanging Woman Creek crosses one big coal, the Canyon Coal. And um, big in this terminology is 20 to 25 feet thick. We, although the only wells that we had available to sample were fairly far from outcrop. Um, and we sampled it at this location in this well. So we sampled it um, a number of locations, trying to, trying to see where it might pop out, where it meets the alluvium. Um, however, it just gets lost in the alluvium. That's my feeling, because there's so little surface water in such a large alluvial package that any discharge probably is dissipated over a long area before you see it in the surface water and it just gets diluted along the flow path. Um, this is the value of the groundwater, these red squares here and here. This is carbon, this is strontium. And again, there's no, no trend at all as you move down gradient in um, Hanging Woman Creek. As far as carbon and strontium are concerned, however, we did measure oxygen and hydrogen. And here we have oxygen on the x-axis, hydrogen isotopes on the y, and the samples from Hanging Woman Creek are these blue dots here, the two years, um, and then we had two different labs measuring it. But it falls along this very nice um, up gradient to down gradient trend, showing the effect of evaporation on this small creek, which you would expect to be fairly significant. You can take this evaporation line and take it backward toward where it meets the, the meteoric water line, and you can see what the original water source was. And these are Anderson and Canyon Coals, which outcrop up gradient from here. You can't say with, um, with any degree of certainty that that's the only source, but you can say that it's likely one of the sources. It could be a source of water creating this evaporation line. But you can't quantify it, and so um, wasn't necessarily useful for our ultimate purpose here. And I think that's it. <laughs> Bev. So, Liddy, you um, sampled some, I'll say, watersheds, coal, that being watersheds, where this model sort of worked and made sense. Yes. And you sampled some where it didn't. Mm -hmm. If I sent you to some other places, mm -hmm. where coal, methane watersheds, what is it about them? Could you just look at them and look at their geologic map and say, I don't think this is going to work here? Or, um, yeah, I think this is likely to work here. I hope that these five watersheds that we measured have enough variability that's given me some understanding that I would be at least wiser in my choices. Um, I can't say for certain that I'd be able to hit the nail on the head and say, absolutely, this will work here. But we know now kind of what to look for. Um, Otter Creek and Powder River have very few surface inputs um, along their pathway in the wintertime. 
Rosebud Creek has at least two that flow that we weren't able to sample, which complicated things. So definitely being able to uh, sample where and when you'd like would play a big part in that. And also small streams crossing big coal outcrops, I'd say that's one of the things to look for. The Powder River worked because it's not too big and it crossed a whole bunch of outcrops and we spanned a long distance However, in that distance, um, for the most part, in between the coals, there's a lot of shales, and so you don't expect a lot of other base flow, but you might, it's because it was such a long distance, you could expect to see sandstone inputs as well. And so then, what we didn't have were good sandstone wells that we could sample. And so that would also complicate the, the quantification. So being able to sample all your end members well, and then um, being able to control for additional sources. Larry, so I don't know if I'm putting words in your mouth, but in the end, would you say dewatering the coals doesn't affect the surface water much based on what you <coughs> Well, luckily for me, it's not my job to create a value decision right. on whether or not um, 0.1 CFS is important. You know, that's up to whoever is, you know, interested in using the water for other purposes. I put it out there. Uh -huh. 0.1 CFS, is that important to you? Yeah, I mean, to some people, and depending on what you're using it for, yeah, it may be. But on the other hand, if it's 0.1 CFS into the Tongue River, maybe not. So um, I'm glad that it's not my job to place a value on it. So yeah, there is a contribution, um, and, and it's up to uh, regulators and interested parties to determine whether or not it's worth fighting over. You had the graph that showed what the produced water was predicted to be versus what it turned out to be. Uh -huh. did, did they have similar data from Wyoming? Did they see a similar thing? Or? Um, I don't, I mean, in fact, Andy might be a better, right. better person to ask here. Um, do you know, Andy, in my, in my understanding, they didn't put together the same uh, predicted water production. But you, you worked on the EIS, so I don't know. My mind back. Um, I don't know. I know that... I know we had many meetings talking about the chemistry of the water we would be using and also the well projections and I think water production rates, but I'm not sure that we all settled on the same water production curve. I think we had one curve for Montana and they had a different <coughs> curve for Wyoming because they had more history of production at that point. Yeah, my guess is um, Montana's was limited because the play was very limited. It was um, very isolated to this one area that happened to be very um, geologically fractured. It had a lot of fault blocks that turned it out to be um, barriers to flow. And so therefore the Wyoming or the Montana producers weren't dewatering as much of the coal. There were producers in Wyoming that dewatered for years and never got any gas. And so they had a much bigger play to contend with. And so overall it would probably average out so that it ended up being more average production per well than Montana did. And mostly that's because it was just such a much bigger area and a lot more geologically diverse. Glenn. If you, I'm going back to this, like I'm thinking the Hanging Woman Creek, is that what it's called? Uh -huh. That's an odd name. But, um, <laughs> anyways, if you had more carbon isotope end members, say mm -hmm. like, that sandstone, the fingerprint of that, mm -hmm. and maybe even like the alluvial aquifer, mm -hmm. maybe perhaps more of a respiration signal or something. Would it be possible that those end members plot some way that would make that data useful? That it looks like that data is mixing between mm -hmm. three somehow. Or even look at it, you know, and this is just going back on some of the stuff I do, not with mm -hmm. carbon. I've never used carbon, but, but maybe just picking a downstream location and the watershed and looking at it seasonally of mm -hmm. how it mixes between those two 
Could that could that tell you something, or and even be able to quantify maybe or? In an ideal world, if I had Hanging Women Creek to do over and I had unlimited money to do it with, what I would like, what I would ideally do is install a nested set of monitoring wells near, closer to outcrop through the alluvium into the coal, so closer to where it outcrops, and then also in the alluvium, and then down gradient within the alluvium, because I think what you would see, you'd see that coal signature in the alluvium faster and stronger than you see it in the creek. Um, and so if you had a better set of monitoring wells in the alluvium and also a coal aquifer well closer to outcrop, I think you could probably pull something out of that data. Um, and yes, maybe seasonally if you could see, um, see kind of maybe what the baseline carbon isotope ratio is and, and how it varies um, based on flow rate, that might help you pull something out too. I have one question. Yeah. Whose idea was it? <laughs> oh, yeah, it was my idea. Um, and I was kicking myself. And, um, and I, I hope that um, Simon still doesn't curse my name, but uh, he's an awful good sport. <laughs> Any more questions? Thanks, Lydia. All right, thank you.